All right, so the title of my sermon this morning is The Naked Truth. And I know it might sound a bit odd to preach on the topic of nakedness, but as we go through the sermon, you'll realize that this topic does have a lot of practical implications in our life. So um, this sermon is not so much of one to get you fired up. It's more, this is more a doctrinal sermon explaining the distinction between how we determine what we, we wear. It's not so much about nakedness, it's more about modesty. But just as, as a way of introduction, you know, why, why do we wear clothing? Obviously, it goes all the way back into Genesis, why we wear clothing to begin with. Um, but one, one reason why people wear clothing is obviously for protection. You know, you read through the Old Testament where a poor person, you know, you, if you take their raiment to pledge, you're meant to give it back, right? So they have clothing to keep them warm in the cold and all that sort of stuff. So that's one we reason why we wear clothing. Another reason why we wear clothing, like we see in Genesis, is, you know, after the fall, there was a sense of shame associated with our nakedness. So clothing is there to cover up our nakedness. Um, and, and, and of course, uh, the, the other reason why we wear clothing, we have an element of modesty, right? So modesty is, you know, this sort of attention. We draw ourselves into our body parts and things like that. Now, what I want to just explain in this sermon is our covering, uncovering our nakedness is shameful, right? So that's that's why we wear clothing. But it's not inherently sinful. And I want to explain in this sermon what I mean by that and why it's important in terms of, you know, in terms of how we uh, have practical application in our own life. So the naked truth. Now, number one, first question is, what is nakedness? Right? What is nakedness? Now, you might say, you might just think just generally, well, nakedness is when you're not wearing any clothing. And obviously, you are naked when you're not wearing any clothing. But nakedness is not only when you have a lack of all clothing. Why is that? Because obviously, you know, sorry to put this picture in your head, like if I was naked, right, and I was wearing a hat, I mean, am I still naked? And obviously I'm naked. You say like, well, what if I'm wearing a hat and gloves and socks? You know, I'm wearing more clothes, but am I still naked? Well, you'd say, well, I am still naked, right? So what, so what amount of clothes? You know, what if I wear like wrist warmers and leg warmers? You know, I'm wearing a t-shirt. So obviously there's a certain level where you say there's a certain body part that must be covered in order for your nakedness to be uncovered. And this is why in the Bible, nakedness is a certain area of your body. And that's why we're looking at Exodus 28. I want to focus more so on this passage in 42. Because the Bible does actually tell us what area of the body is actually nakedness. So it's, naked is not just a lack of all clothing. Even though when you have a lack of all clothing, your nakedness is revealed and therefore you are naked. So... The questions we're going to be talking about in this sermon is, you know, what is nakedness? Is it a sin to see somebody's nakedness? And what, er what situations is it a sin? So we're going to go through those questions. I'll explain my position on these topics. So we see in Exodus 28, and if you realize when we were reading through Exodus 28, we're getting a description of the garments that were made for the priests when they went into the tabernacle. It's very interesting, you know, and I, and I won't go into it because I don't know, I don't understand it all myself. But you can see the decorations obviously represents the 12 tribes of Israel. The hole in the top of the vest was, you know, obviously you can put your head through it. Um, and I don't know if you caught it there when we were reading through Exodus 28, but there's actually a bell on their garment as well. So this idea of them going into the tabernacle and moving and you can hear the bell ringing. Why? Because if they died inside the tabernacle, right, they could pull them out and know that they're no longer moving in there. Um, that's, that's what I've been told anyway. So <laughs> what we see here is we have these linen breeches. Now, I believe these are not like an outer garment pants because they were wearing a, a robe. So I'm not of the persuasion that a robe is like a, a dress because men and women wore robes in the Old Testament, which are garments that went all the way down to, you know, to their legs. But underneath that robe, these are, this is more like underwear, right? So this is underwear that goes from the loins to the breeches. And we can, you can even buy underwear like that these days, right? You know, some people wear bikini bottoms underneath, but you can also wear like a, a bike short type of underwear as well, like those sort of shorts. So think of linen breeches like that. So Exodus 28, 42 says, And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. So what are these linen breeches going to, to reach from? They're going to go from the loins even unto the thighs. So what are your loins? And your loins is your stomach, and your thighs obviously are here. So we know that nakedness is between here. Now it doesn't obviously have to be defined. You know, we don't have to spell it out what your nakedness is, but it's the organs that are between here, right? So the loins, even unto the thighs, shall they reach. 
Now, <clears throat> my first question we want to we want to address is: Are thighs nakedness? Now, I don't believe thighs are part of your nakedness, right? And, and, I'll, and I'll go through a couple of reasons because a lot of people teach that not only the section between your loins and your thighs are nakedness, they also teach to be consistent. They think your loins, which is your stomach area, and also your thighs are nakedness. Um, and, and they have obviously their, their motivations for why they, they believe that. Now, this is the thing, right? To me, if, if thighs were nakedness just by Exodus 28, why would you have a garment going from the loins to the thighs? Because if you have a, a garment going from your loins to your thighs, you can still expose your thighs by wearing a garment from your loins to your thighs. So if you wanted to cover up your nakedness, if thighs were included in nakedness, then you would have a garment that went from your loins to your knees, right? So if you had the garment go from your loins to your knees, therefore your thighs would be completely covered. And then if, if we're saying thighs are nakedness, according to this passage, are loins nakedness as well? Because the garment is going from the loins to the thighs. So is our underwear, should our underwear shouldn't go from here? Should our underwear go from here? Right? Should we be wearing like the grandma, you know, underwear and, and pull it all the way up? You know, like my, you know, my wife is pregnant now, so she like she pulls it all the way above her stomach, right? So is that, how, is that how Christians are meant to be wearing undergarments, you know, from the loins to the thighs? You know, so it actually go from your chest to your knees as opposed to from your loins to your thighs um, to cover your, your nakedness. So I don't believe thighs are nakedness, but I'll go through a couple of the passages and, and a couple of things to think about. So my position is, no, uh, thighs are not part of your nakedness. I think your, your nakedness begins where your thighs end. So if you think about your groin area up until your loins, which is obvious what that area is. And I believe it's not only the front area, it's also the back area. And I can prove that from scripture. So here's a couple of things uh, when it, in regards to our thighs nakedness. Genesis 24. This is the story of Abraham sending his servant to go find a wife for his son Isaac. But notice here, when he sends his servant, he, he gets his servant to take an oath to him. And look, he says here, Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. So notice he's just sitting, saying, put, my, put your hand underneath my thigh. Now, let me ask you, do you think it's appropriate, just logically, to touch somebody's nakedness? It's probably not, right? It wouldn't be appropriate to touch somebody's buttocks. It wouldn't be appropriate to touch their groin area. If thighs are nakedness, would it be appropriate to take an oath with your hand on their nakedness? Right? Obviously, to me, it, you know, just, just some things to think about there. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. So that's my first point under this one. And we see here in Genesis 24, that's what the servant did. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning that matter. So I don't know, I haven't really thought of all the ways... Uh, people might get around the, the arguments I make here. Maybe they'll say he's sitting on a chair and he just has the hand like underneath it like underneath, and not actually putting it underneath the thigh. But I, I, I believe that's it's saying what it actually happened. Like for some reason they had a way that they would take an oath and he'd put an ad, hand underneath the thigh and then take, take an oath uh, <coughs> to Abraham. That's, that's one point. Let's uh, look at another point when it comes to, you know, is thighs nakedness? And I'm just giving you some thoughts here on why I don't think it is part of our nakedness. Revelation 19. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So if you don't know the context of what's happening here in Revelation 19, this is when Jesus is, you know, returning, actually coming down to the earth from the heavens to battle, right? So we, we, we see him coming down to the air and, he's, and it, there's a description of what he's like. It says here his, in verse 12, His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and that he should rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. So you're getting this picture, he's coming down on a white horse, he's in a vesture dipped in blood. I believe he's, like, he's wearing a robe like they, they would have worn in those days as well. <coughs> 
So then it says here in verse 16, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So think about this, right? It's saying here that the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords is not only written on his vesture, but written on his thigh. Now you may say, well, that's because it's just written in two places on his vesture. If that was the case, then to me, that this passage would seem a bit redundant to say, well, it's written on his vesture, but it's just in two places. Because if you put it here, technically it's on your clothes as well. So to me, what I think is actually happening here is it's written on his vesture. So that's saying not only is it written on his clothing, but as he's riding on this horse, you can imagine a man that's, you know, girded up his loins to go into battle, right? Obviously, his the lower of his thigh may be exposed as he's riding on the horse. And when you look, you can see also on his thigh that it is written. So if we take it literally for what it says, it is written on his thigh. It's not written on his vesture in the location of his thigh. As I guess people would say, hey, you know, well, he's actually, you know, wearing a pant like garment and it's on his thigh may say about this passage. So that's the second thought there, right? So just a couple of things to think about in Revelation 19. Now, this is, this is probably the passage in Isaiah 47, <clears throat> which would be the main passage that people who believe thighs are included in your nakedness would go to in order to say, hey, here's a verse in the Bible that actually proves that thighs are nakedness. And I'll, as we go through it, I'll show you that it doesn't actually prove what they think it proves. And we'll just go through it here um, together. So in Isaiah 47, <clears throat> the, the people of God are used uh, as an analogy uh, as a lady right so it's um uh oh sorry sorry uh no no, no that's not the case it's, it's talking here about uh babylon for some reason in my mind i'm thinking it's talking about um uh israel so here it says here babylon is is being analogously used as a female who is crossing over somewhere right but notice here in isaiah 47 we'll just read it through it together and and i'll, I'll explain to you how they uh, use it to try and prove thighs are nakedness, and then I will debunk uh, that claim in the same passage. Isaiah 47, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground, there is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called delicate, tender, and delicate. Take the millstones, grind meal, uncover thy locks, make bare the leg. Ah, see, they make bare the leg. Uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivers, thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. So you notice there the analogy here is, you know, he's not, he's not providing, you know, Babylon basically is, is analogous to like this hard working woman that needs to grind the millstone, and maybe she needs to go and travel far, going, you know, crossing over the rivers and things like that. And he's saying basically he's going to, you know, take away the beauty there and, and, and uncover her nakedness. So the, the argument here is, they'll say, see, notice, you see how it says, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh. And then in verse three, you see how that's equated with nakedness. That's why she's naked, because she's making bare the leg and she's uncovering the thigh. So that's what the proponents of people who believe thigh is nakedness would say. Now, why don't I believe this passage is actually saying that? Well, because if you take the whole passage, and I skipped over it just to make the point, but notice here in verse 2, you'll see not only is she making bare the leg, what else is she uncovering in this passage? It's saying, take the millstones, grind the meal, uncover thy locks. So what are your locks? Your hair, right? So she's uncovering. So, you know, maybe she's wearing a veil. She's uncovering her hair. She's also making bare the leg. She's uncovering the thigh. So then you've got to ask the question, well, if you're going to use that sort of interpretation to define nakedness as the thigh, why do we not also consider uncovering your hair as nakedness? Because she's doing both here. So which one is it referring to? Why, why when you're uncovering several things in the passage before, is it then nakedness only applied to one of them? So what I'm, what I'm seeing here is, what I, how I understand this passage is, yes, she's going to be uncovering certain things because she's going to have to do this hard, hard work. But also her nakedness, which is the area we talked about, is also going to be revealed. So I don't believe this is saying that uncovering the thigh is nakedness. I just think what this is saying is she's going to uncover the locks and make bare the leg and also have her nakedness shall be uncovered, right? Because God talks many times about discovering the skirt and all that sort of stuff in order to uncover and put shame on a nation. So notice, this is the key verse. 
right? This is the key verse where they'll say thighs are nakedness and you can see if you're consistent in how you understand it, uncovering your locks is not nakedness. So why should uncovering the thigh also be nakedness if you're consistent with this whole passage? Now, what are some practical implications if people believe that thighs are part of nakedness? Well, some practical implications would be, well, then they'll say, well, then women you know, should never wear, you know, short shorts, mini skirts, things like that. And, and I would agree on the basis of modesty, right? So it's not that I don't, I don't agree necessarily the same standard of clothing. What this sermon is trying to teach you is we, we don't have to have unsound doctrine to promote a certain standard of, standard of clothing. It's better to just have the sound doctrine when it comes to what nakedness is and sins regarding nakedness and think of it in terms of modesty rather than nakedness. So, you know, should women wear bikinis? Should women wear short skirts? Are they naked when they wear those sorts of things? Well, technically, no, they're not naked. You know, like if a, if a woman wore tight pants or if a woman wore really short shorts, is she technically naked? No. But that doesn't mean she should technically wear those sort of clothing, right? Because we also have modesty to think about as well. This sermon's not so much principles of modesty, but I'm saying just because it's, you're not naked, that doesn't mean it's okay to do, right? But we're saying, you know, it doesn't mean it's therefore inherently sinful to wear these sorts of things, right? Because there may be reasons why women wear these sorts of things. They may be a competitive athlete, you know, these sorts of things. They're not going to wear necessarily a long dress if they're like a bicycle rider like a, and things like that. So I don't want to go through all the different situations, but I'm sure in your own life you can think of situations where certain clothing may be suitable for that situation. Now if thighs are nakedness, you've got to ask, sometimes people are not consistent because they say, well, women shouldn't wear short shorts but then it's okay for men to wear short shorts. So if, it, if thighs are nakedness, they need to be consistent. If women can't wear something to mid-thigh, then, then men shouldn't either. But you don't see a lot of the men that believe thighs are nakedness wearing three-quarter shorts, right? Because if you wore three-quarter shorts, then when you sat down, they'd come up to your knees. But no, a lot of men, they just wear regular to the knees, and in fact, just above the knee normally, your shorts, shorts. And then when you sit down, ah! Your nakedness is getting revealed, right? So th these, these are the sort of things, the situations you can think of to think, well, do people even practice it consistently? The people that um, believe thighs are nakedness. And, and generally, if they did, then they would wear, in my opinion, uh, three-quarter shorts. <coughs> so just in regards to thighs, it's not about nakedness. It's about modesty. Now let's go on to the next question. The next question is, are, are breasts nakedness? Now, like I said, and I'm going to drum it in this sermon, just because it's not nakedness, that doesn't mean you just walk around topless, right? Because there's modesty, right? But technically, a man's chest is not nakedness, because remember, nakedness is between the loins and the thighs. And technically as well, a woman's breasts are not technically nakedness, right? So if a woman is wearing shorts and she's topless, she's technically not naked, according to the Bible, but it, she's very immodest. Right? I'd say by anybody's standards. So the answer really is no. And, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll just show you something interesting here in Song of Solomon 7. So Song of Solomon is a passage where a man is describing his wife, just describing like all her features as he goes from, and he actually goes from like foot all the way to head. But notice what is missing in, in this passage. So we'll read through it and we'll see here what's missing. Song of Solomon 7. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes? O prince's daughter, the joints of thy thighs are like jewels. So notice that, you know, if, if it's inappropriate to talk about somebody's nakedness, why is he openly describing this lady's thighs, right? So he starts from the feet, he goes to the thighs, the work of the hands of a cunning workman. So obviously he's talking about, you know, God has formed this beautiful lady. Thy navel is like a round goblet, which wanteth not liquor. Thy belly is like a heap of wheat, set about with lilies. So notice what got skipped over there. Feet, uh, thighs, and then it goes to the navel. Why? Because it wouldn't be appropriate to talk about a woman's nakedness, right? So that's why he's not describing that. But what has he described? The thighs, the navel, the belly, and now thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. So he's describing those things. So it sounds like it's appropriate to comment on this when it comes to your wife, right? But 
you know, not when it comes to the nakedness. Thy neck is as a tower of ivory, thine eyes like the fish balls in Hespon. Uh, by the gate of Bathrabim, thy nose is as the tower of Lebanon, which looketh toward Damascus. Thine head upon thee is like Carmel, and the hair of thine head like purple. The king is held in the galleries. So notice there how it's described all out, but skips over nakedness. Right? Is that, is that just a coincidence, or is it showing that you know, there's something that's appropriate to talk about, and there are other things that are not appropriate to openly talk about? So... So some people will think, well, you know, it's like, uh, they'll say, well, breasts aren't nakedness, therefore, you know, like breastfeeding is a good example. They'll say like, well, then women should just be able to just pull it out and just breastfeed and, and not really care about it. And, and the only reason why men are lusting after breasts is because, oh, because society has sexualized the breast, but really the breast is just like this utility, just this human, you know, milk bottle, and it really shouldn't be thought of sexually or anything like that. So... I just want to show you, in the Bible, that's not the case, right? Like, there, there are two purposes for the breasts in, in the Bible, as well as, you know, as, as you would understand it as well. So one is, the breast is used, obviously, feed the, the young children. Lamentations 4, look at this. Even the sea monsters draw out the breast. They give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the sucking child cleave it to the roof. Of his mouth for thirst. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you where you're really thirsty. And, and like, because sometimes, like, I've been really thirsty, and maybe like we've been playing soccer, and your tongue literally sticks at the top of the back of your throat, and you're like, oh, you have to sort of detach it. Has anyone ever had that happen to them? Yeah. So when I read that, I'm like, oh man, it reminds me of that moment, like, oh, I'm like choking because I'm like, you know, you're breathing and you're, and you're, and you're thirsty. Um, on that note, I will take a drink of water. <clears throat> Even the uh, verse 4, the tongue of the sucking child cleaveth to the roof of his mouth for thirst. The young children ask bread and no man breaketh it unto them. So that's one purpose, right? One purpose obviously is to feed your children, but obviously there is an intimate purpose as well. And, and there are verses in the Bible about this too. Proverbs 5, 19, look at this. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. So don't get this idea that it's just society that has sexualized the breast. No, no. God sees the breast as sexual things as well. And this is why, you know, it's, it's, it's appropriate between a husband and a wife for them to enjoy each other's bodies. So there's two purposes there. So don't get this idea that, well, it's not nakedness. Therefore, when I breastfeed, I can just show everyone my breasts and everything like that. And it's your problem if you just think sexually about them. No, in the Bible, it's, that's the case as well. Now... Here's an interesting passage that I just thought I would bring up, um, just so you understand what this is talking about. But you read in Job 21, it says, Shall any teach God knowledge, seeing he judgeth those that are high? One dieth in his full strength, being wholly at ease and quiet. His breasts are full of milk, and his bones are moistened with marrow. And another dieth in the bitterness of his soul, and never eateth with pleasure. They shall lie down alike in the dust, and the worms shall cover them. So I had somebody ask me one day, it's like, what, is this, what does this passage mean? Like, how, it's like, you know, do, do men have milk in their breasts? And, you know, sometimes people, I don't know if you've ever read articles about it, but, you know, like, uh, it's sometimes when men go through puberty, their, their, their nipples may milk a bit, and, and there's all this weird stuff out there and stuff like that. But this is not about a man breastfeeding, right? So if you ever read this passage, and you're like, his breasts are full of milk? Does that mean men have a responsibility to feed children as well? No, so to, to understand this passage, if you ever come across it, and I'm just reminded because, because of the topic of the sermon, what this is talking about is it's talking about, you know, obviously if you, if you think about the context of Job, it's like one person having a good life, one person having like a cursed life, right? So when, 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 a, when one man has a good life, when it's saying his breasts are full of milk, that's saying the breasts that he sucked as a child, his mother, you know, is not breasts that are, are barren and dry, right? So when it's saying his breast, it's not talking about his actual chest. It's talking about the breasts that he sucked are full of milk and his bones are moistened with marrow. So if you compare it here, for example, to Hosea 9, look at this. Give them, O Lord, what wilt thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. So you see like a curse in the Old Testament is when God would curse somebody for their sins and this doesn't apply to us in the New Testament because we are under uh, the covenant of grace. 
But back then, part of the old covenant curses were that you, you would not be able to bear children. You would lose your children in the womb. But also this, dry breasts, meaning that your breasts would not bring forth the milk needed to feed your children. So when you think about that, it puts that passage into context. Now, let's just talk about some practical implications when it comes to breasts um, and nakedness. So the, the main, the main uh, sort of scenario, like I talked about already, is breastfeeding. And like I said, you know, you don't want the attitude of, well, breasts aren't nakedness, you know, and society is just uh, sexualized them, which is not the case. So therefore, you know, it's just okay in every instance to be a bit lackadaisical about breastfeeding your children. And if people catch a glimpse of my breasts, that's their, their problem, no? So it's covering your breasts when it comes to feeding your children is not an issue about nakedness. It's an issue about modesty, right? Is, is, it, is it modest? So, you know, when, when you feed your children, especially, you know, my wife, she will take the effort to either use a cover. If she doesn't have a cover, she may find a private area or at, the, at least the very least, like you get a chair and turn around, turn into a corner so that you can hide your breasts from people that may catch a glimpse of it. So it is all about modesty. But when we talk about practical implications, let's say, a woman is like a refugee or something. She's got her children. She's on a crowded boat. Is she sinning by taking out the breast and people, you know, maybe catch a glimpse of it? Can she not feed her child in a situation where there are people all around her? Now, if you think it's a sin to see a woman's breast, or the breast is nakedness and it's a sin to reveal your nakedness, then she wouldn't be able to do that, right? Because she would, by God, she would have to keep God first and not sin and then not be able to feed the child. So. This is why it's important that you distinguish between what is shameful, why we do things because of modesty, and not necessarily because we're trying to avoid a, a, a sin that people think is a sin, which is revealing your nakedness, because then you condemn people, or you make people think that they shouldn't do things in certain situations where it may be appropriate. But at the very best, you know, women breastfeeding should try and cover themselves up, right? And this is why women need to think about the sort of tops that they wear. Right? Women, like ladies, you gotta, you got to cut a brother some slack sometimes. So it's not always about modesty, but you have to think about what sort of environment you're creating in this community, how you address, and women need to also consider how, to, how do guys think. Now, I'm not saying, therefore, that guys dictate how women dress, because a woman could be dressed quite modestly, and guys will still lust after it. But it's something you have to keep in mind. Right? You have to think about, hey, how do I dress? Am I wearing tops that are too tight? Am I wearing tops that are too low? Hey, you may wear a top that's high, but think about, hey, when you lean over and you're, you're helping your kids, you know, sometimes that, that reveals your breasts as well. So you've got to think about these things when you're trying to cover up. So low cut, tight tops. Um, you know, another one is like, you know, like bag straps, I think is, a, is an important one to, to, to think about, where you may wear like a, like a side bag or a handbag and you know if your top is really loose and you put it across your chest, just think about how that makes you look as opposed to just wearing it on your shoulder. So these are the sort of things that women need to think about and they may not be thinking about because they're not necessarily thinking about things from a man's point of view, but it's very important to try and maintain a modest environment in our church. So those are some practical applications. Now let's go on to the last question. And this one, you know, when you read the question, you may think like, well, this is like, you know, a little bit weird or a little bit shocking. But um, I'll just prove to you the point from the Bible. Is it a sin to see someone's nakedness? Now, your first reaction should, you know, would, you know, would probably be, well, it is. But is it always a sin in every instance to see somebody else's nakedness? Right. So I want to talk through some of these things and some of the verses regarding this. So my answer to this question is not inherently, it's not inherently sinful to see another person's nakedness. But what I will say is obviously lust is naked. So lust is the desire to sleep with somebody. So obviously if you're lusting after somebody due to seeing their nakedness, obviously, you know, or lusting after them, therefore you want to see their nakedness. That intention is what is sinful. Matthew 5, 28, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So lust obviously is a sin, but just the sight of a person's nakedness is not in and of itself 
morally sinful. Now why? Here are some points I would like you to consider. The first one is we go all the way back to Genesis where God creates Adam and Eve. Now Adam and Eve are created naked, remember? Because it was after Adam ate of the fruit of the tree that they realized they were naked. And then the shame of that nakedness comes on them. They try and hide themselves by sewing themselves aprons of fig leaves. And no, notice it's aprons of fig leaves. Normally when you, you know, when you, uh, you know, read about Adam and Eve and see it in a children's book, it's always... Adam has an apron of fig leaves, but Eve has an apron of fig leaves and two extra fig leaves, right, <laughs> to, to hide that, which is, uh, is about modesty as opposed to so much nakedness. But notice here in the beginning, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. So Eve is created from the rib of Adam. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. I take that verse to mean that's the covenant, right? That's why when you are married, you say, I now take you to be my wife. So this is the same. It's like he's taking her and accepting her as one flesh, right? Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So that's the covenant. And obviously the consummation is when they physically come together. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Look at this. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So notice that before the fall, you have a man and a woman who were not married, seeing each other naked. Now think about this. If, if it were not possible to look at a naked person without a sinful lust, then Adam would have already sinned, could have already sinned at this point, right? Because you're saying, well, if you, if you say, you know, every time you see somebody's nakedness, you're always going to last, and therefore you should never see somebody's nakedness. If you make that argument, well, this just goes to show that it is possible to see another person's nakedness and not sin. Right? Because otherwise, Adam wouldn't have to eat of the fruit of the tree. He would have already sinned just seeing eat. Now, also, if just seeing somebody, even without lust, was sinful, then as well, how, how can the fall not have already happened at this point? So you see how if they are standing there, they aren't married because God actually makes Eve, brings her to Adam. If it's a sin, just the sight of somebody's nakedness, then Adam would have already sinned. And not only that, God would have caused Adam to sin because who does that these days, right? You say, well, I'm gonna, you're going to marry this girl. You're not meant to be seeing each other naked. Whereas here, you know, if, even if they did in this instance because they didn't have the shame that we have today, it's not sinful in and of itself. So do you understand the points I'm making there? So here it shows two things. Two things are, one is it's possible to look without lust and not be sinful. And it's not a sin in and of itself to see someone naked because if it was, this would be the first sin in the Bible as opposed to eating of the fruit of the tree in the, in the next chapter. Now here's another one. And these are, these are passages you may not be familiar with. But uh, interesting nonetheless, and I think prove that uh, just viewing somebody's nakedness is not in and of itself sinful. Isaiah 20, at the same time, spake the Lord by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go. I just, I just said the scene here. So Isaiah, obviously a prophet of God. God is now going to give Isaiah a command to follow in Isaiah 20. Look at what the command is. And if you've never read this chapter before, it might uh, be uh, a bit surprising to you. At the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah the son of Amos, saying, Go, and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. So this is not Isaiah's idea. This is God telling Isaiah, This is what I want you to do. I want you to take all your clothes off and walk naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah, hath walked naked and barefoot. Look at this. Three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia. So he didn't do this for a day, a couple, three hours, like three days, three months. He's doing this for three years. Crazy. But, you know, he's a, he's a faithful servant, right? Barefoot, three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt, upon Ethiopia. So shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians' prisoners and the Ethiopians' captives, young and old, naked and barefoot. 
even with their buttocks uncovered. So you see that phrase there, even with their buttocks uncovered? I believe this is a verse that does prove that buttocks are our nakedness because of the word even. It's kind of like in John 1.12, right? As many as uh, received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It's sort of equating those two phrases. So here, young and old, naked and barefoot, even, we're saying, how are they naked and barefoot? Even with their buttocks uncovered. So I do believe you can prove from the Bible that buttocks are nakedness. And that would line up with nakedness being between the loins and the thighs, right? Because you've got the front area and you've got the back area. <clears throat> to the shame of Egypt. So what I'm asking you to consider here is if God commanded Isaiah to reveal his nakedness and walk naked for three years as a sign to the judgment of these nations. One is, how can it be a sin to, first of all, expose your nakedness for, for certain reasons? Secondly, how can it be a sin to see people's nakedness? Because obviously Isaiah is a sign to people for these three years. And it's not a sign if they have no, no idea what Isaiah is doing. And thirdly, if it's a sin, how can God command somebody to sin? So you see how it can't be sin inherently in and of itself. So you say, well, why do I think it's wrong? Well, we ought to think it's wrong to reveal nakedness because it's about modesty, right? So again, it's about modesty. It's not necessarily about nakedness. Now let's go to Leviticus 18. I'm not going to read through the whole chapter, but Leviticus 18 is a passage where it's using the euphemism of uncovering somebody's nakedness or seeing their nakedness as a euphemism for actually sleeping with them. So we can't take this euphemism literally and say, use this passage to say it's a sin to uncover somebody's nakedness inherently in and of itself, you know, not thinking about the situation. Because obviously if you're uncovering it for fornication or to lust after them, like it talks about in Habakkuk, you know, woe unto them that give his neighbor drink, you know, that they may see their nakedness. So that's, you can see the intention there. It's not just in and of itself seeing the nakedness because you have to be consistent. If it was, then in Isaiah, what Isaiah would have done would have been sinful. Now, how do we understand Leviticus 18? Let's just read through two verses. I won't read through the whole chapter, but the rest of the chapter in regards to this topic is very similar, right? It's just talking about near of kin and it's specifying difference of near of kin. It says, None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. So what you have to understand in Leviticus 18 is to uncover somebody's nakedness is not only used in the Bible to actually physically uncover somebody's nakedness, but it's also used as an in, a euphemism, right, to actually sleep with somebody. So a euphemism is like a, a nice way of saying something that is a bit more crude, you know. So the nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. So I'll just read that verse but if you read the chapter and you keep reading, it gives all different scenarios where it's saying these are the sorts of near of kin that you ought not to sleep with under the Levitical laws. <clears throat> now, think about this. If the, 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 to me, the most reasonable explanation of this passage, of these passages, is to not take the euphemism literally, right? And that it is a euphemism to sleep with them. Now, why am I saying this? So, if you think about the, the practical applications of saying, well, you can't see a near of kin's nakedness, and it's actually the sight of it, as opposed to sleeping together, right? If it just re refers to the sight, then why would God have to sort of redundantly just, first of all, say, don't uncover the nakedness of near of kin? What, what does it matter if seeing anybody's nakedness is sinful. And then why would he have to laboriously outline specific scenarios of near of kin so you get an idea of what near of kin is, if it's just about seeing anybody's nakedness regardless, right? So there's that to think about. Now, and if it was a sin to see your near of kin's nakedness, like the passage says, then you've got to think, this is where people get these ideas, well, ah, oh, you know, well, maybe I, you know, I need to, cover my eyes or something when I'm changing my baby. 
Oh, when I'm bathing my babies, is it right? Is it right for a father to bathe his daughter? Is it rather right for a mother to bathe with her son? You know, is, is it wrong to have showers together and things like that? So this is not an issue of nakedness, right? This is an issue of modesty and children maturity and these sort of factors, as opposed to it being sinful in and of itself. What about the other way around? You know, what if you need to care for a loved one? Are you not allowed to help them change their diaper? You're not allowed to wipe them down, clean them in those areas because you're not meant to see their nakedness? See, so these sort of practical ways people try and hold to these positions, a lot of these people don't work in these industries, right? Because if you worked in those industries, you'd realize this is completely impractical. How am I meant to love this person? And, you know, are you, are you then only allowed to work you know, care for your family, but this is what it's outlawing. It's outlawing near of kin. So am I only allowed to, to, to uh, be a healthcare worker for somebody I'm not near of kin to because the Bible's telling me I can't look at near of kin? So you see how like if you take this approach that it's not a euphemism, that it is just sight, then you come into all these obstacles where it doesn't even make sense and it's not even consistent with other parts of the Bible. So what is Leviticus 18 talking about? Leviticus 18 is obviously talking about having sexual relationships with near and kin and the problems associated with that. Okay, so this is not a passage condemning just the sight of nakedness. Okay, let's look at another passage, Genesis 9. Genesis 9 is the passage of Noah getting drunk, right? And then Ham seeing his father's nakedness. His brothers don't want to look at them. They go back with a cloth, cover him, don't see his father's nakedness. And then Noah wakes up, realizes what his son has done unto him, and then curses Ham's son. Right? So he doesn't curse Ham. He says, curse it be Canaan. He curses Ham's son. So I won't read through the whole passage, but you'll see here in our verse, uh, he's naked in his tent, uncovered within his tent. It's Noah. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. And, um, he's, and then he talks about Canaan having to serve uh, Japheth. <laughs> so a couple of thoughts here is, there are different views on Noah waking up and knowing what his younger son had done unto him. Right? Obviously one view is they think just viewing the sinful, the nakedness was the sin that he did and they sort of back it up. We see how the other brothers wanted to cover and therefore they didn't see the nakedness, they didn't sin and therefore Noah didn't curse the other two, he only cursed Canaan. Now, like I said, you know, we can't take this passage in isolation. I'm trying to, we, we have to understand it in all, in the context of all scripture. If it were a sin just, just for, for Ham to just see Noah's nakedness, then obviously all the other passages we talked about already would, wouldn't make sense, right? Now, does that mean Noah can't curse Canaan for just viewing his nakedness? Because maybe Noah was ashamed, because you could take the position, well, Noah, well, he didn't like the fact that he was shamed, you know, in front of his son. His son went and told other people. And, and therefore, that's why he got cursed. So you, you could say, well, just because Noah cursed Canaan, that doesn't mean necessarily it's inherently sinful to see his nakedness. It's just because that event happened, because that happened, and Noah was ashamed, and his, and his son, rather than just covering him up, went and told the other two brothers, right? That's why he was cursed. So it could be either he was just ashamed, or he was upset at Canaan for not helping to cover his father's shame and rather than covering his father's shame went and told the brothers and then the brothers did what right was right which was cover their father's shame now the other position on this passage is that Canaan actually did something to Noah right actually did something physical right not just the sight and the telling which you know could could be a sound position in and of itself that would be enough for Noah to be upset at, at Ham right just to shaming his father but some people believe, and I think it's, it's not a strong argument, but it's not an unreasonable argument, that Ham actually molested his father, right, in some way or another, right? Uh, the, way, the way a sodomite would. So, when he awoke, they make the case, this is why when he awoke, he knew what happened to him, because he could feel it, 
right? You feel his body was, was assaulted. But you could also make the case that he just awoke and knew what his son had done unto him because Japheth and, and Shem had told him as well. So it works both ways. But the reason why I'm saying it's not completely unreasonable, I personally believe it's just the sons shaming the, the ham shaming Noah as opposed to actually doing something to Noah. But if you take the position that Ham actually did something to Noah physically, you could defend that because the euphemism of seeing a person's nakedness, like I said, is just the same as, as sleeping with them. And we see that phrase, not just about uncovering the nakedness, but seeing the nakedness used as a euphemism as well for sleeping together. This is Leviticus 20 verse 17. It says, And if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness, and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He hath uncovered his sister's nakedness. So again, some people might use that passage to say it's just wrong even for siblings to look at each other's nakedness. But then you ask the question, well, is it wrong if you have a, a son and a daughter who are really young bathing together? No, of course not. So you, then you say it's about the situation. And when it's about the situation and it depends on different factors, this is now when you're talking about modesty, right? You're talking about appropriateness, all this sort of thing based on children's maturity and whatnot. So what are some other practical ap applications that I haven't mentioned already? Male gynecologists. Male gynecologists is one that always comes up when it comes to seeing a person's nakedness. Like people will say, oh, men, you know, you know, why would any man want to be a male gynecologist? You know, what, that sort of thing. Well, you know, it's, don't be so hasty to judge people's intentions and people's heart and how they find themselves in a certain profession and all that sort of stuff. But the point I'm trying to make here is not, you know, every man should be a gynecologist and all that sort of stuff. What I'm saying is, it's not sinful in and of itself for a male to be a gynecologist. You know, that's all I'm saying. You know, should men be gynecologists? It's probably better that women do that sort of stuff, but you know, it's not sinful in and of itself for a man to do that. Just like you know, nurses are generally women, but then sometimes you have male nurses and things like that. So the reason why it's important is because, let's say for example, you're in a situation, and, and this is where people's views and positions can impact, have practical implications on people's lives. Let's say, for example, you are not well off, right? And you can't, you can't necessarily afford to hire your own gynecologist or a midwife, right? So you, are, you financially are forced to just go to the public hospital and take whatever gynecologist that they have there due for financial reasons. Now, if your gynecologist happens to be male, are you in sin? So you see how you might, you might have thought when I started this sermon, it's like, Oh, why is Victor Tree? What has this got to do with anything? No, it's, it is very, very practical in our lives. Like these, these sort of positions that you take on these things determine the sort of decisions you'll make for yourself and for your family and how you will counsel others to say, look, you know, th this is your only choice. You may have to, to go ahead with it. So it's the same. That, that's a situation you may find yourself in where you can't afford private health care. You can't afford to hire your private lady midwife or a lady gynecologist. So you have to take whatever is from the hospital under our socialized, you know, silly, tell me, I won't go into that. But you go to the hospital, your only gynecologist option is a male. Are you in sin? Well, if you take my position on these things, it's not a sin, right? Because, you know, you, you may want to, at the best of your ability, for modesty's sake and appropriateness sake, have a female gynecologist. But if you need to have a male gynecologist, I don't believe it's sinful in and of itself. It's not sinful for you to necessarily reveal yourself to this person for that, you know, patient-doctor relationship. Neither is it a sin for him to see that. Now, if the intention of a gynecologist's heart is because he wants to, to look at women naked, obviously that's a sin for himself, you know, between him and God. But what I'm saying is you can't take the position that every gynecologist has that intention. Every gynecologist is always thinking about that in every situation with every woman that, that he's looking at. And you know, you know, maybe a gynecologist that has some integrity and knows that he struggles with those things might say, well, I'm a male gynecologist, but then I might only deal with like elderly lady, right? So then I don't struggle with that as much. And maybe the younger women, he may have a stance, I go, hey, the younger ladies, I will refer on to a, a female doctor or a female colleague in the hospital. So there are ways that you could work around it and try to cater to modesty. But if you make it a sin, Therefore, it's wrong in every circumstance. And I think that not only is unbiblical, but it's impractical as well. Male gynecologists, emergencies. You know, like if a woman is 
you know, like, you know, she's dying in a car crash or whatever, and you pull her out, and that may risk, you know, ripping her clothing off or whatever. Her clothing is on fire, you rip it off. I mean, would you not instantly just do that? You know, not thinking about the situation of nakedness and all that sort of stuff and, and lust. But if it's a sin to look at somebody else's nakedness, you, you wouldn't be able to pull those clothes off. You'd have to go, I mean, who can pull them off, right? Because if, you, if you, the clothes are burning, nobody can take them off because nobody's allowed to look at the person's nakedness. So you see how, like, it's, it's, it's silly when you just think through, how am I actually going to implement this in my, my life, in these, in these situations? So we already talked about changing nappies, young, old, bathing together, young, old. These are issues of modesty. So what's the purpose of this sermon, guys? I thought it would be interesting, first of all, for you guys, and it's a question that people have asked me. I want to just lay out what I believe about it. But the purpose of this sermon is sound doctrine. It's about sound doctrine. It's not about changing our standards. You know, in fact, our standards should be higher than the world. Should we be dressed more modestly, you know, more godly than the world? Of course. But just, we just don't want to use argumentation that is unsound biblically. Because you know what? If I could figure this out, your kids will be able to figure this out. People in the church will be able to figure this out. And if we take these unsound positions, they're going to grow up and think, ah, oh, it's so baloney, right? You have all this irrational reasoning for why you're telling me to do things. But if we have sound doctrine, if we argue things rationally, reasonably from the Bible, then we have a hope of, you know, convincing our children to follow these same standards because they know why they're doing it. And the same here. I am trying to get you guys to understand why I have the standards I do and why I try and promote certain level of standards in this church, not because of nakedness, but because of modesty. And I want you guys to think of these things. So before you say something like, oh, you know, Victor, you know, if you teach that it's not a sin to reveal your nakedness, and people are just going to, you know, girls are just going to walk around topless and in miniskirts and, you know, all that sort of stuff. You know, guys are just going to oh, go look at watch pornography because it's not a sin to see somebody's nakedness. You know, obviously that person is being unreasonable, right? Because, like I said, there are other factors to take into account for why you don't do those things. I'm just saying it's not a case of nakedness being sinful in and of itself. So modesty is what drives our clothing standards. It's not seeing a person's nakedness is inherently sinful. So what I just want to end on really quick is just five principles for modesty. I'm just going to mention them. I'm not going to preach on them because this is a whole other sermon in and of itself. Some things for you guys to think about. And I made them all start with A. All right, so they're easy to remember. All right. One principle of modesty. One is, is it allowed? What does that mean? Does your father allow you to wear that? You know, does your husband allow you to wear that? Children, do your parents allow you to wear that? If you're not allowed to wear it, it's off limits already. It doesn't matter if it's whatever. If, you're, if your authority in your life says you're not wearing that, you are sin in sin wearing that, right? Authority, or are you allowed? A second thing you consider is your attitude, right? Are you wearing something thinking, like, I don't care if people lust after me. Or, hey, if I wear this, people are going to look at me. People are going to look at my curves. You know, people are going to look at my muscles, that sort of thing. See, the attitude that you have, right? If you have that sort of attitude, yeah, then you are in sin because you've got the wrong attitude. You don't have a loving attitude towards your brothers and sisters in Christ and to, to the world, right? Number three, think about, is it appropriate? What I mean by appropriate, see, like when we talked about even nakedness, it's like, hey, with doctor-patient situation, you know, are you in some competitive sport where you need to wear a certain garment in order to maintain competitiveness? You know, that, that I would think is appropriate. What about, you know, you go to a fancy dress party? You know, do you necessarily have to dress immodestly? Well, maybe not scantily, but you could wear something that's a bit more out there. But are you sinning? No, because the, the situation calls for it, right? A fancy dress party. Uh, you may go to a wedding, you know, a wedding people dress up, they put on makeup, they do their hair. Are you in sin? No, because it's appropriate for the occasion. What about four? Four is, when it comes to attention, what I want you to think about is, what sort of attention is it getting me? Right? So if you're wearing, if it's bringing attention to certain areas of your body, if it's, if it's drawing the sort of attention from boys that it shouldn't, right? or it's drawing the attention from girls that it shouldn't, that's something to think about as well. And the last one, 
number five, I think of the verse, you know, abstain from all appearance of evil. So you as well, not only to have an attitude of blatant wanting people to sin, but also you need to consider as well how you do look. You may, your intention may not be to sin, but you know, like the, the mini skirt and the tight top and whatever, it doesn't necessarily make you look like a godly person. You know, just by the world's standards, by the social standards out there. So I'm not saying, like I said, social standards set the rules, but it's something, these are things that you need to consider when you're deciding to make a wise choice of what to wear, all right? So are you allowed? What's your attitude about it? Is it appropriate for the situation? What sort of attention is it getting you? And what does your overall appearance look like? You know, when you're sort of being a good example to the wider population. Anyways, I hope that was a blessing to you guys. Hopefully you learned something. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, there's, uh, you know, even on a topic that people maybe you don't give much thought to, it's, it's very practical in our lives and your, your word has so much to say about it, Lord. So I thank you that you give us, you know, this direction in our life and give us uh, these uh, pearls of wisdom, Lord. Help us to implement these pearls of wisdom in our life. And I pray, Lord, that this, this sermon would not cause people to reduce their standards, Lord, but they would lead them to increase their standards of godliness and modesty, but Lord, for the right reasons. So I pray for these things and ask you, Lord, to edify our church. Help us to be a good example to one another and to our children. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.